Welcome and thank you everyone for tuning into our latest economic outlook report. Focus on what's next with CPG and a look at the overall economic baseline scenarios. Joining us on today's call is special guest Nicole Kalita. Nicole is Nielsen Senior Vice President of U.S. Brand Effectiveness. We are especially excited to have Nicole with us today as she is known for her ability to create differentiated value in the marketplace by measuring evolving consumer patterns. And this has made her a force in the industry, so we are excited to hear what she has to say. Per usual, please welcome Previdere's Chief Economist, Andrew DeGay, who will provide an overview on potential uh, recovery scenarios and next steps to planning, as well as an overview of where the U.S. consumer is currently at. Andrew, it would make sense to um, begin with you today to get an overall feel on what's going on with the economy and what you're seeing in terms of consumer sentiment. Thank you, Nicole. Yes, I think the when we look at what is going to happen in the second half of the year, even thinking about you know going all the way out to 2021, uh, it's important to consider the fact that yes, we are in a period of elevated uncertainty, and this is going to impact the consumer in many ways. But we need to start narrowing down what uh, these assumptions are going to look like uh, for the second half of the year. So what we provided you with today is just a, a very simple baseline of some economic assumptions that our economist team have been working through to say what does the future look like now we what we don't know is exactly how consumers are going to react in the next 6 12 months uh, coming out of this downturn we know that the un unemployment rate is rising that jobless claims you know for over the last few weeks have topped the multi-millions uh, in new claims every single week. However, what we also know is that over 80% of these new jobless claims are temporary, right? As this is a health-related crisis and a lot of the social distancing and closing of non-essential businesses uh, is impacting normal employment as we know it. So what is gonna come out on the other side? We've created this baseline scenario highlighted here in blue, and we're using this to kind of guide our customers to be thinking about what does the new consumer look like uh, in this new economic environment? And we've also uh, surrounded that with, uh, with a kind of a high side and a low side scenario, this optimistic and pessimistic. I think when we look at the baseline, let's talk about that first. So our general assumption is that the economy and the consumer are not going to come out of this crisis the same way they came in. Yes, there is a, a rapid, obviously, economic impact when it comes to layoffs and jobless claims, and then even the federal monetary policies, stimulus packages, what the Federal Reserve has been doing to try to bolster the economy in the near term. Well, we think all this shakes out. We're going to see businesses reopen. Uh, however, we're not going to regain all those jobs that were lost. I think an important part of this is also going to be the consumer psyche. And we're going to talk a lot about that from early signals from consumer sentiment surveys about how consumers are viewing this crisis compared to previous crises. When we look at our baseline scenario, of course, it's important to consider that this is first and foremost a health crisis, and so the recovery depends on the health crisis subsiding in order for business to resume back to normal. I think we have enough examples from countries primarily in Europe from which to model the U.S. recovery. We're starting to see and have conversations about slowly reopening parts of the economy. And I think the emphasis here is on slow, right, that we might be past the peak amount of new COVID-19 cases, but that's really only the beginning. Social distancing is still going to be a practice that we are going to be talking about and experiencing in our everyday lives for months on end, even after businesses start to open. So the economic ramifications of this are going to be played out with slower economic growth on the recovery side uh, and still strong you know, economic decline here in the near term. When we talk about optimistic and pessimistic, we could take different approaches to this, right? On the optimistic side uh, is that these stay-at-home orders get removed in relatively swift fashion and that consumers and their sentiment and attitudes tend to rebound uh, rather rapidly, viewing this crisis as temporary. Job uh, businesses hire back most 
of the employees that were laid off and they continue to invest in the economy and in the future. And hopefully that the stimulus money is enough to provide stop gaps both, both for businesses and for consumers and this doesn't brought into a wider financial crisis. On the more pessimistic side, we could see this turning into a financial crisis all its own that kind of separates itself from the health crisis where many businesses who've had to float a business with no revenue or very little revenue for months on end end up defaulting or moving into bankruptcy and this could spread contagion uh, throughout uh, the financial markets uh, as well as in business to business activity. This obviously impacts global trade and so we could see more weakness in manufacturing and, and things, things of that nature and that consumers come out of this crisis uh, with a different uh, psyche and attitude about shopping and spending and spending and discretionary spend. So that's more on the pessimistic side. We think that the baseline really is going to be more of a U-shaped recovery, right? That there is going to be recovery on the on the backside of this, but important for anyone who cares about consumer spending, consumer shopping habits, which is why we have Nielsen here on today's webinar, we know that it's going to be very important to be following multiple data points because we know that uh, the consumer is is going to be changed in many different ways and so that a part of our baseline scenario is considering the fact that we're going to need to continue to monitor many different metrics around uh, consumers financial health as well as their mental health uh, coming out of this this crisis and looking in the second half of the year some of the early signals that we're seeing are coming from consumer sentiment surveys. And this is really interesting because we can get a read on how consumers are feeling and thinking about today versus in this chart, what we're showing is a year ago. And what we see is that on net consumers are thinking more conservatively. People are thinking of spending less in many areas. Now, of course, there are some winners and we, and we know that those winners are gonna be grocery stores and consumer staples. And we can see that according to the spending plan index, consumers are thinking about even over the course of the next six months, the fact that they're thinking about we're gonna be stuck at home more, grocery spending is likely to be more as well as the essential beer, wine and alcohol category. Most other areas though, consumers are thinking about slowing down their spending. Now, this isn't necessarily gonna mean year over year decline for many of these categories, but it is gonna mean growth rates that were previously elevated back when employment was full and wages were rising pre-crisis is now gonna be at least at a slower growth rate for many of these categories. And you can see the ones that are impacted the most now have to do with the fact that of the sheltering in place, right? No, not as much need to go out and buy apparel, um, not as much ability to go out to eat, even if you wanted to. This is obviously impacted greatly from where we were not only a year ago, but even just a few months ago, back when we were looking at this health crisis from the outside, uh, looking in when it wasn't impacting the United States directly. So for all real economic reasons, this is this is a shock. And we I wanted to compare this shock quickly for uh, our viewers compared to previous shocks in US economic history, dating all the way back to 1970s, we have consumer sentiment from the U University of Michigan. And I picked out four cases where we saw a very steep decline in consumer sentiment in, in a single one or two month period. And this April 2020 fits the bill, right? With COVID-19, the health crisis, uh, changing consumer sentiment from 20 year highs, uh, right down to the lowest levels we've seen since we were coming out of the last recession back in 2008 to 2010. The last comparable, to, most recent comparable to this uh, is 2008 in the financial crisis when stocks fell 20% in one month and we saw consumer sentiment fall to uh, a near record low. Now you notice that during each of these crises, the, the cause of the crisis is going to be different, right? It's just a really a matter of how the consumer reacts to the crisis. And so while it, the May 1980 or even the October 1990 crises were really driven by rapid increase in oil prices, today we're seeing the opposite and we're even seeing negative uh, prices on oil, which would have been just unfathomable just a few months ago. 
Um, the, the real impact here is that consumer sentiment can fall very swiftly even after it's been at periods, long periods of above average consumer sentiment, such as the case with October 1990. Consumer sentiment was pretty elevated through the latter half of the 1980s and as it was over really the past five years in the United States. But then once it falls and falls sharply, we'll notice that in 1990, the recovery May, might have come swiftly, but it wasn't sustained. There's lots more volatility in consumer sentiment, consumer attitudes. People get jarred by uh, these uh, economic influences and impacts, and that can impact their spending habits for many months or even years after the initial crisis happens, right? It can turn you much more conservative. Nobody likes to file for unemployment, uh, even if they uh, know that their job loss is temporary, it's a new experience, and also brings to many things into consideration in, in terms of what you're going to spend your, your future dollars on. So we want to put that in perspective is that consumer attitudes don't recover quickly from severe economic shocks, and so we might be looking at a totally different mindset of consumer even a year from now, even if the health crisis is gone and, and we find a new vaccine uh, to take care of COVID. 19. So it's with this kind of recession-minded consumer that we're comparing uh, this that moment in 2008 when the stock market fell 20% and saying, well, how does that compare to what consumers have been feeling now in the most recent survey? And we can see that consumers overall are still not as pessimistic as they were in October 2008. If we look at the far left side here, that composite indicator, the green line being above the blue line, uh, but there are areas where today's spending plans are lower than even 2008, and people are thinking about cutting back on things like apparel or toys, uh, and, and yes, particularly going out to eat. Uh, and the interesting thing is that these questions are really posed about spending plans over the next six months. So it's not necessarily what you're spending on now, now that businesses are shut, but what it, what's your spending plans gonna be over the next six months? And what this tells me is that a lot of consumers are thinking recession-minded. The fact that they're thinking that they're gonna be drastically cutting back or decelerating their spending plans in many different areas over the next six months, even though most people are expecting that these shelter-in-place policies will be lifted more in the near term in the next you know, month or two. So when we look at the second half of the year, we do need to consider the fact that heading into the Christmas shopping season, uh, or even as um, those businesses that have been deemed essential start having to compete with those non-essential businesses again, that we're gonna be likely seeing a more conservative wallet spending out of consumers uh, heading into the second half of the year. Now, it is in this context, I think that we can really need to dive into details and learn more about what is the consumer doing throughout this crisis that'll give signals about how they're gonna be reacting after this crisis. And I think there's really no better place to turn uh, than the holder of all of, uh, of this great data on consumer spending trends, uh, Nielsen. So with that, I'm gonna turn over the presentation to Nicole to talk more about uh, the consumer behavior. Thanks so much for that introduction, Andrew. I think so much of what you said is so compelling, and I can tell you that every day we're getting so many questions about how what we're experiencing today compares to some of the past financial crises that we've seen in the U.S., and in particular the Great Recession of 2008 into 2010. And so what you said, Andrew, was really compelling to me. Financially, what we're seeing is similar in a lot of ways, but this is a pandemic, and behaviorally, things are a bit different. So I'm going to spend some time with our audience talking a little bit about the behaviors that are driving change right now. You talked, Andrew, about elevated uncertainty and unknown future. And the thing that I couldn't agree with you more on is that there's a new consumer that's emerged. And we're thinking about it actually as a totally new era of, of consumer behavior. So we'll dig into that a little bit more today, too, and, and maybe draw some parallels near the end together on how consumer behavior and how the financial impact could affect our, our partners in the industry moving forward. One thing is very clear, no one is untouched by COVID-19. In some way, all of us have been impacted by this pandemic. In fact, I've recently heard a, a comparison that we may be in different boats, but we're all in the same storm. And I think it's a really compelling way to think about 
the, the personal and business related impact for each of us as, as we move our way through the COVID-19 pandemic. As consumers ourselves, we've experienced a lot of uncertainty, long lines, long waits for fulfillment, out of stocks, not just on our favorite products, but on a lot of the staples that we're trying to put in our pantries. But I think there's no doubt that more than anyone, retail has been affected. Whether it's online or offline, this particular group has been hit really hard. And their response to this unprecedented demand has really changed consumer behavior. It's easy to feel like in these times there are more questions than answers. It's, it's pretty hard to predict the unknown, and even many of our experts are stumped. You know, historically, when we think about measuring consumer behavior and how it relates to consumer consumption, we see certain trends that are pretty consistent. For example, consumption can pretty easily correlate to gross domestic product over time. COVID-19 has introduced a completely new element and a level of uncertainty, even to some of our models. So I like to joke that even our models have had to adjust and learn. And I'll give you one example that I find quite interesting. As we looked to start to forecast demand for the short term for some of our partners with relation to you know, products in the marketplace today, our models, when just left to run their basic work, predicted that toilet paper would account for 8% of total US GDP in just four weeks. So we're having to approach everything really differently than we ever have before. All of these forces are driving monumental disruption. And there are two key disruptive forces that we've really focused in on as we started to analyze the early impacts of COVID-19. The first is pandemic pantry loading. What does that mean for us? Well, just in the month of March, consumers added an incremental $18.8 billion to the CPG industry. We've been able to use models to isolate that volume to be truly incremental as a result of COVID-19. 10 billion of those dollars, or over 10 billion of those dollars, are actually attributed to increased usage. So consumers are buying more, but they're also using more because they're in their homes. 8.2 billion of those dollars, however, are due directly to pantry loading. So this is a behavior change in which consumers are stockpiling product to ensure that they don't run out in their homes. The second disruptive factor that we're seeing very clearly is a surge in online orders. Again, just in the month of March alone, online CPG orders grew by 60%. 37% of that growth was driven by completely new households to CPG online purchasing or to significantly increased purchase frequency in the CPG space. These just start to show us just some of the factors that differentiate the position that we're in as an economy and as a CPG industry today as compared to some of the things that we experienced in the, in the 2008 Great Recession. But either way, these numbers are staggering, and it's really clear that they'll shape our future. Both online and offline volume moved pretty similarly through these COVID-19 times. And, and as I talk about these times, I'm generally looking at the month of March into the first two weeks of April, so around five weeks of, of volume here, six weeks of volume here. As penetration and frequency were really maxed online early in the month of March, we saw a shift of consumers back into offline channels or in-store shopping behavior. No matter whether it was online or offline, week ending March 21st really demonstrated a peak in total buying behavior across all channels. Consumers not only increased their frequency of purchase, but they increased their basket sizes as well. In fact, in the week ending March 21st, Basket sizes on average were up 17% for consumers. And, and to add a little color to that, it's pretty interesting when you think about the amount of categories consumers purchased. During that same week ending 321, consumers purchased on average from four more categories than they did in any other pre-COVID times. So 
the stockpiling behavior that occurred here was very, very clear. As a result of all of this, our fulfillment have been pushed to their maximum and in many ways beyond their maximum. When we think about online fulfillment specifically, we saw that consumers' time to fulfillment increased by almost 30% during that same week ending 321. This is not even including the consumers that couldn't get delivery, just simply couldn't get anything from Amazon or Instacart. Speaking of those companies, we know that they weren't pushed beyond their limits. So Shipped and Instacart were working hard to really staff up to try to respond to this demand. And even Amazon had to temporarily suspend non-essential delivery so they could ensure that they were getting essential items to consumers that were in need. At the end of the day, 10% of consumers still told us that they had to cancel their orders online because of lengthy delivery options. And just as, as I mentioned already, that doesn't even include the consumers that couldn't get a uh, click and collect or a delivery spot in their online orders. Both sales data and consumer behavior are painting a picture of a really changed consumer. This idea of a new era of consumer behavior is really, really prominent. These consumers do not shop by channels. I think we've known for some time that consumers don't think of shopping in online or shopping in offline, but COVID-19 has created a step change in behavior that has really brought this consumer change to light. Consumers shop via need state, and the need states that COVID-19 have created are different than those that we've seen before. Consumers are shopping with health and safety in mind, first and foremost. They're simply trying to avoid the virus and avoid germs. But in addition to that, consumers are responding differently to things like store closures for non-essential items and shelters in place across most, if not all, states. This tells us that measuring your total commerce in this new era of consumer behavior is more important than ever before. This consumer behavior has also brought to light three distinct product groups. This is quite interesting. This is looking at Nielsen sales volume across all measured channels for the month of March. And even this early in analyzing behavior, we can see some really kind of quite unique behaviors emerging. The first is pantry loading. And this is quite simply categories like household cleaners, of course, toilet paper, but also dried beans, canned beans, and different, different products like that. This is consumers telling themselves that they will always have this product in their home and they will ensure that they will not run out. So their in consumption may be increasing a small amount, but more than anything, there's kind of a safety factor here where they wanna make sure they've got these products in their house. The second distinct group is increased usage. This is consumers recognizing that their life is different and their behavior is adjusting alongside of it. Think about these categories as frozen pizza, baking, and then the category that even our chief economist, Andrew, deemed essential, beer and wine. So we know consumers are using more, and they're also increasing their uh, purchases of these products to reflect that behavior. The third group is short-term stock up. And I, I really like to think of this as panic buying. This is defined best in my mind by the category of rubbing alcohol. You couldn't walk a store in early March without seeing massive out of stocks in the rubbing alcohol bandages areas of the store. These are areas where consumers panicked when they purchased, but they have not increased their usage in any way. A couple other categories that fit into this are things like flu medicine. You only use it when you need it, yet consumers stockpiled it to ensure that there would be no miss should they encounter a need. Pet food is another interesting category that falls here. Consumers wanted to ensure that their pets were taken care of, but they had no increase in usage in that category. And then finally, we're actually starting to see a fourth group emerge, and it's quite interesting. It's do it yourself. So you think about all the services that many consumers have the luxury of paying for, like haircuts or manicures, uh, being unavailable, 
we're seeing those categories start to skyrocket with things like hair clippers, electric shavers, and nail polish separating themselves as their own group of behavior. All of these behaviors will impact volume, and so it's, under, it's important for you to understand when you can anticipate changes in this behavior and how you can help plan for this demand that consumers have. If you think about the difference between increased consumption and pantry loading, what you can expect is a change in how consumers will engage with that category over time. We used some of our uh, scan and consumer behavior assets paired with some stated consumer behavior on pantry loading behavior to estimate what volume would look like at a category level over the next 13 weeks. And you can see really unique patterns coming to light based on consumer behavior or consumer needs state. Categories that are, are classified as increased consumption are really gonna see some tailwinds in the coming weeks. Consumers have expanded their consumption and are also increasing their purchases of these categories. Whereas categories that have been panic bought or pantry loaded are going to see lower than expected volumes sooner than categories that have those tailwinds of increased usage. If we know anything, we know that the future remains a bit uncertain. Globally, consumers are telling us that their behavior has and will continue to change from a cooking and working at home perspective to travel and grocery shopping. Consumers expect these changes to last at least four or more months into the future. And we know that that's going to significantly impact global business. So embracing this new era of behavior also requires a new approach to measurement. If you approach measurement differently, it will allow you to move with agility in solving for today, to really move with speed and with an organization-wide effect to plan for tomorrow, and then ultimately to start to prepare for the future. Andrew talked a lot about the uncertainty of the economic headwinds that we're facing, and I spoke a lot about how consumer behavior may change and may impact volume down the road. It's important to get line of sight into those things today so that you're prepared when these changes come. Thank you for having me here today, Andrew. I appreciated the time. Thank you, Nicole. Those, it was very insightful. Thank you for joining us. Thank you both for your commentary. Um, Nicole, we sincerely appreciate uh, getting Nielsen and your point of view on CPG Impact and looking forward to the recovery. Um, and opening up to the new normal. Um, Nicole, we hope you will join us again. I feel like um, we could definitely expand on this conversation. Absolutely, um, I'd love to join you again. Oh, fantastic, looking forward to it. So that concludes this CPG-focused economic update. Our thoughts are with all of you and your families, as well as the many scientists and healthcare professionals working through today's crises. Uh, stay tuned for our ongoing uh, webinar series. I believe we'll be presenting um, a follow-up presentation with Nielsen in the next month um, as we exa examine again the evolving landscape. Should you have any questions for either Nicole or Andrew, please feel free to contact me directly and I will forward your inquiry on to the right person. Thank you.